Psalm 119, verses 153 to 160. Consider my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great are your tender mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to your judgments. Many are my persecutors and many my enemies, yet I do not turn from your testimonies. I see the treacherous and am disgusted because they do not keep your word. Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. The entirety of your word is true, and every one of your judgments, righteous judgments, endures forever. Let's pray. Holy God and Eternal Father, we thank you for the day in which you blessed us with, the last couple of days for sure. Thank you for the safety of everyone who's been traveling and who will continue to travel. We pray for them. We thank you for all who are here. Thank you for those who are online. Thank you for the many technologies we have that we get to do this. Father, we thank you for bringing us into 2023. May this be the best year of our lives, and may this be the best year for your honor and glory. Please forgive us of our sins, and it's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. Would you please turn to 511? 511. Off we come together, off we sing and pray. Here we bring our offering on this holy day. Help us, Lord, thy love to see. May we all in truth and spirit worship thee. May we keep in memory all that thou hast said. May we truly worship as we eat the bread. Help us, Lord, thy love to see. May we all in truth and spirit worship thee. May we all in spirit, all with one accord, take this cup of blessing given by the Lord. Help us, Lord, thy love to see. May we all in truth and spirit worship thee. 160. 160. 160. <clears throat> down at the cross where my Savior died, downward for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin, Jesus so sweetly abides within there at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. 
There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. <clears throat> 203 203 Man of sorrows what I name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing rude. In my place condemned he stood. Seal my pardon with his blood. Alleluia, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we. Spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement, can it be? Alleluia, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven exalted I. Alleluia, what a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransomed home to bring. Then I knew this song will sing. Alleluia, what a Savior. 950. 950. 950. Your only son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. O oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified. They laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in his precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side. To be led by your staff and rod, and to be called a Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, 
God, sweet Lamb of God. I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in His precious blood till I am just a Lamb of God. Father, we thank you for a memorial that we have. We don't do this because we have to necessarily. We do it because we get to. And as one man years ago reminded us, may we never forget. Father, we, may we never forget that night when they reclined at the table and Jesus took that bread, that unleavened bread, and divided it amongst those disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. That's our intention. We ask for your help in doing it. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Father, we continue thanks for what's in the cup. Jesus said, drink from it, all of you. It is that third cup of that cedar celebration, the cup of redemption. Drink from it, all of you. Unfortunately, Father, some people are concentrated on the cup instead of what's in it. Jesus said, that is my blood. What's in the cup is my blood shed for the remission of your sins our sins. Help us to partake of this in a manner that pleases you well. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. Four hundred seventy seven. Remember, the chorus goes at the very last, 477. The statutes of the Lord are right and do rejoice the heart. The Lord's command is pure and doth light to the eyes in part. Unspotted is the fear of God and ever doth endure. The judgments of the Lord are truth and righteousness most pure. They more than gold, yea, much fine gold to be desired are. Than honey from the honeycomb that drop a sweeter far. Moreover, they thy servant warn how he his life should frame. A great reward provided is for them that keep the same. Oh, do not suffer sin to have dominion over me. I shall be righteous then and from the great transgression free. Oh, how love of thy law. Oh, how love of thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Oh, how love of thy law. Oh, how love of thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Would you please mark 500? 500. That is what we will be using as a means of encouragement this morning. Say hello and welcome to everybody that's here. Happy New Year. If you haven't heard me say it to you already. I know somebody's already saying, well, that was a week ago. Uh, well, I've slept since then, so you got to give me a break. But uh, I did not put in the bulletin, but we do have it next week. Uh, the 15th is the third Sunday, and so we will have our Sunday night potluck. And uh, so if you uh, uh, are of the persuasion that you like to eat, and you can tell I, I don't, <clears throat> uh, please uh, 
please make plans to be here. Uh, it's a great encouragement, great to get together with everybody. In fact, we got to do that with a couple of members from Silver a couple of weeks ago, and it was almost like home. Uh, but I laughed when, when I was saying we got the tail end of that cold front that Oklahoma and Texas got. And I said, yeah, I never got above 40 degrees. And Don said it never got above two. So count our blessings. Turn to Joshua chapter 10, please. Joshua, the 10th chapter. Being a geography teacher, there are things you teach and there's things that you forget. And since I hadn't taught geography in a long, long while, I got to meet someone who moved back from the state of Alaska. And the first thing I asked her was, is how in the world did you ever survive living in Alaska? Whereupon she said, you just got used to it. And I said, what I, my, my second question was, and I'd forgotten after we talked a little bit, and I said, I want to know how you live with six months or six weeks of darkness and six weeks where the sun never goes down. And I loved her answer. It was the same answer I got from a couple of members. Her great nephew lived there, or excuse me, her nephew lived there. And his dad said, dark curtains. Go to YouTube sometimes and you will see that at three o'clock in the morning, it is just as bright and as sunny as it is at three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, that's never happened in our history, has it? That's never happened in the history of the world. Oh, yes, it has. But it's happened all over the world. It's happened one time in the history of the world. You see, Joshua is dealing with not as bad. We, if you wanted to compare the two classes of Israelites, they're not as bad as the ones Moses had to deal with, but they're pretty close. In fact, they are so close that sometimes it makes you wonder if there wasn't any difference in the two people at all. But Joshua's mistake was that in Joshua chapter 6, for example, if you go back there, the first city to be conquered by the Israelites was Jericho. And since the last city was, or the first city was to be conquered, that all belongs to God. Every bit of it. Yet, Joshua's mistake was, is the same mistake the children of Israel make in chapter 9. And that is, they never talk to God about it. They never pray to God about anything about it. They never talk to God about doing anything. And so it is that you would think that they would talk to God, especially when you've got about 2 million to 2.5 million people who are surrounding the walls of Jericho. For six days, they go around at one time and then they go back to camp. How long does it take two to two and a half million people to go around a wall? I don't know. But it was a monstrosity of a project. And on the seventh day, they went around it seven times. And the wall fell. The walls fall, uh, fell down. Well, God says everything that's there belongs to me. So... Oh, come on. AI? I mean, think about it. Let's just start the United States going to Grenada. The way we did that in 83, didn't we? How long did it take us to, to conquer that? How long did it take us to go to Panama in 1983 when, when uh, Manuel Noriega said, bring it, President Bush, and he did. Six hours later, Manuel Noriega is being arrested and is in Miami. And by the way, he sued a I, uh, I, I thought it was hilarious. He sued a one of these uh, video game makers over uh, uh, copyright for his face. I was like, how in the world do you do that? But anyhow, he lost. Didn't take long at all. That's the image. That's what's happening in Joshua chapter 7. And that is AI. It's just this little hole in the road. It's just this little place that there's no way AI could win this thing. And so what does Joshua do? Boy, they get up the next morning and they're going to conquer the second city. And Joshua comes back 
and the people come back with their tail up between their legs and they're defeated. And the first words out of Joshua's mouth is, God, oh, this is going to sound so familiar. God, why'd you set us up? Why did you say, and while Joshua was praying, God said, shut up. My favorite two words from the movie Shrek is, two words, shut up. Shut up, they're sin in the camp. And they go through and they find that Achan had taken things that belonged to God. They were accursed things. They stoned Achan and his family. They burned them. And then God, Joshua goes to God and says, shall we take Ai? Oh, I'll surely, I'll surely hand them to you. What happens? Joshua says, I got this plan. This plan is if you go this, we'll split into company of three. If, if they come after you, we'll come in from this way. And, and, and it was a wonderful plan. Wonderful plan. So that's not going to happen again, is it? They get to chapter nine. And the people make an agreement with the people of Gibeon. They make a people agreement with the people. God said, I'm going to give you the land of Gibeon. I'm going to give you the promised land. All you have to do is take it. And they didn't do their homework. They didn't do their checking. And what happens? God says, you didn't consult me, did you? You didn't talk to me about it. You didn't talk to me at all. So what happens? You get to chapter 10. And Adonai Bezek, he recruits four other kings of the Amorites, and he says, and he's terrified of what Israel is going to do. But he does the next best thing. He does, he took a page, and I think this is what Saddam Hussein, this is one of the places Saddam Hussein learned very quickly that you do. And that is when you are going to be attacked by a country, you attack a country that that country is attacking you, they're best friends. Because what happens, he knows he's about to be attacked. He just doesn't know when by the United States. So does, does Saddam Hussein attack the United States? No, he attacks Israel. We had already given him Patriot missiles, 100% accuracy. Every one of those Scud missiles that they bought from the old Soviet Union, we destroyed. That's what Adonai Bezek does. And these five kings, and they're going to go after Gibeon. And Gibeon says, hey, wait a minute, Israel. You've got to, you got to, you got to help us. We have a, we have a treaty with you. We're, we're your slaves. We're, we're your. And Joshua said, you see what you should have done is destroyed these people. That's what God told you to do, but you didn't do it. You didn't consult God. You didn't come to me and so, so we could consult God. So now what are we going to do? We're going to fight. And so what happens is they get in this fight, and it's a chapter 10 and verse 1 that I want us to read. It came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and utterly destroyed it. And as he'd done to Jericho and its kings, so he'd done to Ai and its kings, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they greatly feared because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai and all its men were mighty. Therefore, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Ahoam, king of Hebron, Hiram, king of Jamath, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debra, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, that we may attack Gibeon, for it's made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jamath, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered together and went up, and they all in their armies camped before Gibeon and made war against it. The men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp at Gilgal, saying, Do not forsake your servants. Come up to us quickly. Save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites who dwelt in the mountains have gathered against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. So the Lord routed before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them along the road that goes to Beth Oren, and struck them down as far as Azekah and Makeda. And it happened as they fled before Israel, were on the descent of Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven as far as Azekah 
and they died. There were more children or more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. And Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said, in the sight of Israel, sun stand still over Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not go down for about a whole day. And there's been no day like that before it or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. And Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp of Gilgal till he finds out that those five kings are in a cave and he destroys them. But what in the world has this got to do with you and me today? I mean, we can stand here all day long and talk, but we're not going to do that. Don't panic. But what, what has this got to do with you and me today? If I could convince, if God could somehow come here and convince people of this, I think we wouldn't have a lot of the problems that we've got today. We, we, we wouldn't have people driving by the building. But somehow or another, we decided years ago as a generation, not all of us, that we're going to listen to three people, me, myself, and I. And we got it in our minds, just like the rabbi Harold Kushner got it in his mind to try to explain how a Luke, how a, his nine-year-old boy got leukemia and died, that God created the heavens and the earth, and then he just put it into existence, and then he just let it go, and he went and sat in the rocking chair, and he's got hair down to his ankles, and he steps on his hair all the time, and he's got a beard that goes all the way down, and he walks around with a cane. That's not God. God is so interested in his people. Nahum chapter 1 and verse 2 says, God is a jealous God. Now, this is going to sound strange from a teacher and a preacher. But I hope by our Wednesday night studies, you understand what I mean by this statement. God how many times are you going to try to get people to repent? God, why do you keep trying to get people to repent? They don't listen to you. My heart broke when I found out one of, one of um, uh, Silver graduates worked at Country Kitchen, and I heard on the scanner Christmas morning, that a 22-year-old young man took a rifle and put it in his face. My heart broke more when the ambulance got there and you could hear it in the guy. You could hear the frustration and the tears in his words going, call OMI. I talked to my friend who picked him up he was going to call me, but he was afraid Christmas morning we were already in services. And I said, no, you could have called. And then when I found out who it was, my heart broke even more. And all he could tell his mother was, I'm sorry. Sorry for what? Have I thought about suicide? Yes. Have I wanted to do it? Yes. Have I done it? You see me standing here. Because a convict, something that the Holy Spirit convicted me one time. I'm not trying to get a holy roller here, but the Holy, the holy Spirit convicted me one time. Hey, boy, whose life did you give to? And whose life are you trying to take? It isn't yours anymore. It's not yours anymore. And that's what God's trying to say when he, you, write, you read 66 chapters from Isaiah, 52 chapters from Jeremiah. 48 chapters from Ezekiel, 12 chapters from Daniel, and then you go to all those minor, and they all say the same thing. 
And when we get to Malachi, the day of the Lord, that's the last thing God's going to say for 400 years. 400 years. Think about that. 400 years. This country is 200 and what? 57 years old? 247 years old? It's going downhill very quickly. But it can turn around quickly. This past week proved that, didn't it? <laughs> and all God's trying to get people to do is put him first. And you go, God, why are you so interested in people? What is it about? I mean, have you seen what they do? Have you seen the way that I, this morning, somebody's in there, um, a, a wife's in the car, locked the car so the husband doesn't hit her. He'd already thrown her up against the wall. Chris Beard, who is our brother in Christ, shame on him what he did to his wife. I don't care if she broke his glasses. He had no business hitting her. And he's been fired from the University of Texas as basketball coach. Shame on him. We are like that, aren't we? Shame on him, and we just get rid of him. God says, I'm never going to get rid of people. I'm never going to do it. I'm never going to give up. We 80s kids know Rick Astley's song, don't we? Never going to give you up, never going to let you down. That's God. God's so interested. Look at what he sees. He, he knew what was happening. He knew what was taking place. Number two, God fights for his people. My friend in Blackwell, Oklahoma, didn't know what he did for me a few weeks ago. Most of you know what's going on with my situation, and, and uh, it breaks my heart. But I know the truth's going to come out. But I'm sitting there doing some things, and all of a sudden he reminds me, remember, the Bible promises God will fight for you. And boy, I, I heard that just like I heard that Owen Michael. I heard that just like I hear things that, that are either pertaining to members of the church. I don't have a scanner, so I can be nosy. I know people have accused me of that. But 99% of the time, if it's something I don't even know, I just turn the mute back off television and we go. But the Lord fights for you. Leviticus 26, 18, back in the Old Testament, he promised. And by the way, there's three other times in Leviticus 26 that he says the Lord fights for you joshua 7 go back to ai the mistake that they made was it didn't ask god if they could go god would have told them no that would have broke their heart but they wouldn't have lost all those israelites they wouldn't have lost all those people and what does he say in Joshua 23, 10? He's in the middle of his valedictory address. He's getting ready to die. And he says, if you'll put the Lord first, the Lord will fight for you. You won't have to fight. My mind goes back to, to 1 Kings chapter, or 2 Kings chapter 18. In one night, Jesus Christ, the angel, killed 186,000 Assyrian soldiers before they ever got to Jerusalem. I hear people say today, God doesn't, God is not a God of fighting and God is a God of peace. Yeah, he's a God of peace, but don't make any mistake. He fights. How do I know that? When we fight, well, what do you mean we fight? You see, we've had a war declared upon us. We didn't declare the war. We never declared the war. The devil declared the war on us. And God didn't just say, well, you know what? I, I, you guys are on your own. Well, you, you're just on your own there. Oh, no. No, no, no. What does he say? Be strong in whom? In the Lord. 
and in the power of his might. That's why he asked us to do some crazy things like pray for those who spitefully use you. Bless those who persecute you. I'm reading the easy to read version the other day from Matthew chapter five. And I'm reminded they're going to insult you and they're going to say all kinds of things about you. And my mistake and the sin I will confess this morning is I'm not rejoicing over the fact that great is your reward in heaven. See, it's not this life. Oh, it's this life. But this is not it. The Lord fights for us. And isn't it wonderful that we don't know what he's doing? I had somebody one time said, wouldn't you love to know what the Lord was doing, is doing right now? No. No. But you're a preacher. Precisely. Do you know I stay confused about 25 to 35% of the time as to people's behavior? <laughs> I try to ignore the other 75% to 70%. So, the other day, let me give you an example. I'm driving a bus, and I'm in front of the Chevron on Ridge Road. Part of my route was I had to go down to 6th Street. Yes, I, I, okay, that's another story. I digress. I go down to 6th Street. I'm supposed to pick up one student, and then go to Harrison Smith, and then take them to the bowling alley, and then run down Rosedale Road. So here I am, last day of school. And this guy pulls out of the Chevron on Ridge Road. I don't have any problem with that. Except the problem is he stops in the middle of the highway. And I'm sitting there like, what are you doing? Well, he keeps looking around and he still stopped in the middle of the roads. <laughs> People are behind. I mean, I've got a 30-foot passenger bus. Don't, don't school buses look a little different in color for a reason? There's a guy standing over on that side and he wants a ride. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to get across there to give this guy a ride. He's mad at me because I'm blocking his vision. I had the right of way. <laughs> but God hadn't given up on him. God hadn't given up on that, on that guy needing a ride. God hadn't given up on me and God hadn't given up on you. God fights for us. Number three, God demands obedience from us. This is one of the reasons I pride myself being a member of the Lord's church. We are the only quote, if you'll let me have this word denomination, unquote, because we're non-denominational, non that insists on obedience. Peter and John are being threatened, and they're being told, we told you once not to say anything about Jesus Christ. We told you not to say anything about it at all. And you did it anyway. What does Peter say? We ought to obey God rather than men. And they took them and they whipped them. Now, I have to tell you that I'm a little disappointed with Peter and John's behavior, aren't you? Because you see, they... They went back to the church and they were utterly depressed as to what happened and they were so mad and upset that God had let them down. Is that what happened? No, they rejoiced that they were worthy to suffer for the cause. Are they strange? Yes, but Christian people are strange to the world. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all of those who obey. And we have purified our souls, how? By obeying the truth. Not obeying what we want. I like what David Sproul put, said this morning at Palm Beach Lakes. He said, when Jesus stood there in Matthew 15 and they, they accused him or his disciples of not following the law. No. Following God's word. No. Following and transgressing the command, the traditions of the elders. Jesus turned it on them and he says, let me ask you a question. 
Why do you transgress the commandments of God by your traditions? Ooh, nothing wrong with traditions. The problem is when they start interfering with what God wants, that's when the problem occurs. And that was one of the biggest lessons I've ever had to learn in my life. And that is traditions is one thing. Traditionalism can get you into serious, serious trouble. And this is where I wanted to get to. I'm sorry if I've been in a hurry, but this lesson excited me when I found it. And I'm indebted to the late Mac Lyon for leading me on to it. I want you to picture in your mind asking God for something. Now, I don't care what it is. And you're not going to tell me what it is. And that's between you and God. But did Joshua ask for something big? Yes. He asked that the sun stand still and that the moon not shine. The God of the universe, can he do that? Absolutely. Can the God who's got all power, can he do that? Absolutely. Did he do that? Look at the text again. Joshua chapter 10, verse number 14. There's been no day like it, before it, or after it. Watch the text. That the Lord hated the face or the voice of a man. Go to Revelation chapter 8, please. I grew up with all the pictures of what heaven's supposed to look like. I don't know where they got some of the images artists come up with. Some of them I do. For example, where did we get it in our minds that we're going to float on clouds playing harps? They put some pieces together, I know. But if I were to ask you what heaven is, I've got news for you this morning. You can't tell me what heaven is. You can tell me a lot of similes, likes, and as, but I always grew up thinking that heaven was the solitude place. I mean, last New Year's Eve, New Year's, I wanted to come out of the house. I don't have a gun, but I wanted to come out of the house with a gun and start shooting people. Who in the world thought on a Sunday morning, I know that was their problem, wasn't it? Who thought on a Sunday morning to get up and start popping fireworks and start shooting? Well, it's New Year's. A friend of mine reminded me of that, of something one time. When I moved here, the first time I'd ever heard of them taking shotguns. And he said, I stopped that real quick. I said, why? He said, because I had another friend remind me what goes up must come down. And that happened about a year after I moved here. Somebody got shot in their house because somebody was shooting for New Year's. You see, one of the many reasons I like my hometown is because you can still unlock doors. You don't have to lock a door. It's pretty quiet. The other day, when I was on Zoom, other night when I was on Zoom, I kept wondering what this noise was. There were two birds that got in my mom's air conditioning just where they could stay warm enough. It looked, they looked like big rats at first. Scared me to death. When the birds flew off, I was like, okay. Because I didn't want any rats in that, around the house. I grew up thinking that's what heaven is. Not my hometown, but solitude and quiet. Oh, no, that's not heaven. Heaven is chaos. Heaven is noise. 
Heaven is thunderings, lightnings, all things. And all of a sudden, when you get to Revelation chapter 8, what stops the noise? Don't ask me why he says for 30 minutes. I don't know. Why? What stops the noise? It is the incense. What's the incense? Is it that stuff that we see our Catholic priest friends going around doing this and 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 um, and all? Nope. The incense is the prayers of the saints. You want heaven to stop? Talk to God. Spend time talking to God. Well, you're telling me the God of the universe stops what he's doing to listen to me? If you're one of his children, he is just like my mother. Ask my daughter. Ask my wife. Ask my son. She calls every Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. I rush quickly to get to the phone because I know it's her because I have that awful song, The Eyes of Texas Are Upon You, as a ringtone. And if I don't answer the phone, she calls back later. And if I don't answer the phone after a week or two, you know who she calls? She calls my daughter and she says, where's your dad? Well, he's been pretty busy. You tell him, call me. He's not too busy for his mother. Are we too busy for God? I mean, do we really think that God is just so high and mighty that he's not interested in listening to us? Psalm 6 and verse 9 says, The Lord's heard my supplication. And he will receive my prayer. And what do we know from Colossians 4 and verse 2 and 1 Thessalonians 5, 17? Continue earnestly in what? Prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. Now, don't go home thinking what a member of the church thought. I got to pray 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Paul didn't. Jesus didn't. No, the Greek idea here is you never get out of the habit of prayer. And Wendell Winkler said it best when he said, the most fragile habit we have is getting out of prayer. The weakest part of my Christian life, brethren, is prayer. And part of that is because of what Chuck Swindoll said one time. He said, we think we're talking to air. But the God of heaven listens to everything we say. Oh, how do I know that? Remember back in the book of Numbers? And the people are complaining and they're whining and they're whining and they're whining and all of a sudden they start dying. The reason they start dying is because God heard their complaints and he sent snakes to bite them. And Aaron has never ran so fast in his life when Moses created that bronze serpent. Anybody that looked on the serpent was going to be healed. And folks, that is a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. Lifted up to take away our sin, take away our penalty. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, we call it the doxology. We talked about it last week. But the Bible says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Wait a minute. Huh? Above all that we ask or think? So why should we ask? If God already knows me, if God already knows how many hairs are on my head, Matthew 10, 30, if God already knows what I'm needing before I ask, Matthew 10, Luke chapter 10, Why should I even ask? Because Matthew 7, 7 says ask. James 4, 2 says ask. And by the way, the Greek doesn't say ask. The Greek says keep asking. Keep asking. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, 
And here's the key. Here's the kicker. According to the power that works in us. According to the power that works in us. And so it is that, do we let that power work? I mean, what are you talking about? You talking about some miraculous power? Not necessarily. It's his job to convict the Holy Spirit, Acts 26, 18. And has he done a good job on me? Oh, yeah. There have been times he's convicted me and I didn't like it. But he also told me how to clean it up. That's why it is so important to get this down in our hearts. Got to hear that message. See, I know when my faith gets weak. I, I complain sometimes when I shouldn't complain, but I, I know what the problem is. I'm not spending time in this. See, I, I know the end of the story. You know the end of the story. Paul Harvey made a ton of money off of that series, didn't he? About 3.30 in the afternoon, you used to be on KNFT and you'd hear the rest of the story. You'd try to guess who it was. Well, we got it. We don't have to guess. Who's going to win? God. Believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Folks, I've never seen a time in which this is going to come into question within the next 20 to 30 years. I know there are people who think it, but already we have people questioning whether or not Jesus is the Christ. The son of the living God. Repent of your sins. Luke 13, 3 and 5. Confess him before men. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father who is in heaven. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father who is in heaven. And be immersed, be baptized, be buried with him in Christ. Because 1 Peter 3, 21 tells us baptism saves us. And if we'll live faithfully, and we'll talk about this one a little bit this evening, we will have eternal life. Yeah, but why do I want to do that? Why do I want to do that? My daughter and I were talking the other day, and she's an insurance, still an insurance expert. I hold her at that. And she is telling me that maybe we need to look at other insurance, car insurance, she's talking about. Well, why do you have it? I mean, why do you have car insurance to begin with? Well, it's the law. I know that. But why do you have full coverage insurance? Because I owe somebody. I, that's not what I'm talking about. One of my favorite commercials off KNFT was, you pay for something you hope you never have to use. Well, here's the great thing. You don't have to pay for this. Somebody's already paid this for you. They've already added you to the church if you're a member of the church. You can't join the Church of Christ. You can be added to it. You are have a relationship with God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spirit. You continue down. He's redeemed us. He's bought us. He's for, forgiven us. Oh, my goodness. We're registered in heaven. Hebrews 12, 25. That innumerable crowd spoken of in Revelation chapter 7 that my Jehovah's Witness friends can never explain to me until I go back and try to read it to them. Because they only try to tell me there's only 144,000 Jews that are going to be there. No, don't let anybody tell you that. Eternal life. 1 Peter 1, 9. You see, how in the world this right here is the one I don't understand? Oh, I, I read it. I know what 1 John 3, 1 through 3. Anybody that's known me long enough knows I memorized scripture and I can quote it. But I'm like that little girl. She's drawing a picture of God and about the time we're getting ready for bed. And her dad says, what are you doing? And he says, she says, I'm drawing a picture of God. And he said, well, honey, I don't mean to hurt your feelings or burst your bubble. But she said, or he said, but honey, nobody knows what God looks like. She said, when I get through with it, they will. That's as close as I've ever come to seeing God. I see him in children. I see him in nature. But seeing him face to face, 
seeing him face to face, then I understand, behold, what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God. And it's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when we see him, we will be like him, for we'll see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. And we have an eternal father. We always remember the first part of Hebrew or Hebrews 13, or the second part, sorry. Paul said, or the Hebrew writer said, beware of covetousness. And always remember, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Why? Because he can afford it. He's the fount of every blessing. He can afford the whole thing. Man one time said that his daughter had lived a life of things he shouldn't. She shouldn't. She's trying to turn her life around, and he, she called one day and said, Dad, can I have some money as a loan? And he didn't want her to use it for things she shouldn't have. And he got to praying about it, and he said, you know what? I'll give you the money. Some people questioned him as to why, he would because they've been down that road so many times, and he turned around and he says, you know what? I can afford to live without it. He said, what am I going to do with it if I die? What am I going to do with it if I die? And he says, I gave it to her. Folks, God doesn't need us to give him anything because he owns it all. He has it all. And this morning, if you're here, he wants to bless immensely, more than we deserve, more than we can afford, he wants to do that. He's given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So if you're here this morning and we can serve you in some way, let us know as we sing. Oh, the fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee, may I still thy goodness prove. While the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, either by thy help I've come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee. Never leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Above. Number 10. Number 10, and then we'll be dismissed in prayer. First and last stanza, please. Number 10. Abide with me, tis even tide. The day is past and gone. The shadows of the evening fall. The night is coming on. Within my heart a welcome guest. Within my home abide. Oh, Savior, stay this night with me. Behold, tis eventide. Oh, Savior, stay this night with me. Behold, tis eventide. Abide with me, tis eventide. And lone will be the night. 
If I cannot commune with thee, nor find in thee my light, the darkness of the world I fear would in my home abide. Oh, Savior, stay this night with me. Behold, tis eventide. Oh, Savior, stay this night with me. Behold, is eventide. Oh, God and Heavenly Father, thank you for an awesome day in which you've blessed us with. We praise you. We praise you for the lessons that you've taught us in your word and continue to teach us. And Father, we are so amazed that the God of the universe who spoke things into existence, who has all power, would listen to us. We thank you for prayer. We thank you for the power that's in it. We thank you, Father, so much for your many wonderful, wonderful blessings. Your praise, we praise you for your creation. We praise you for your spiritual creation. Why you put up with us sometimes, we will never know except for love. And that's who you are. Please be with us as we go home today. Keep us back safe and in your care. Bring us back when we're supposed to be back. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. I thank y'all for being here this morning.